Good evening. Uh, my name is John Mulcahy. I'm along with my colleague Yishen Zhang right there, uh, one of the uh, co-interim presidents for the Carnegie Institution for Science. I have the pleasure of welcoming you uh, here this evening. Uh, before we get to tonight's speaker and the program, I just want to also uh, mention that we have our, some of our trustees, our board of trustees here in town, so we want to welcome you and thank you for uh, joining us. We also have our directors from our, uh, all six of our departments are here today, so that's very nice. Um, so I am actually one of those directors myself. I'm the director of the observatories branch in Pasadena, California. One of the very fun things about being an interim uh, co-president has been getting to really hear about the science that's going on in the other departments. And so um, it's been really fun to kind of learn and see what other people are doing. And so tonight is particularly very interesting because I, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Michael Walter, who is our new uh, director for our geophysical laboratory, which as many of you know, is one of our two DC-based campuses. Um, and Mike is pretty brand new to this job. He started April 1st, so this is really his debut in Washington. So let's actually, let's welcome Mike with a clap for that, yeah. We're very excited to have him here. So you'll, you'll be seeing a lot more of him through the year. So this is, well, welcome, Michael, for that. Um, when Carnegie's Geophysical Laboratory was founded, only a few years after the Carnegie Institution itself, little was known about the Earth's mantle and core. But scientists suspected that knowledge of the deep Earth was necessary to understand Earth's outer part, the lithosphere. The, oh, we got a timer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not done yet, okay. Uh, <laughs> the effort to understand our planet's depth eventually centered around an ingenious device called the diamond anvil cell, which can be used to bring tiny samples of material to great pressures by squeezing them between two diamonds. It's impossible to talk about breakthroughs made with this technology without focusing on the geophysical laboratory, where pioneering geophysicists have for decades stretched the boundaries of what the tool can teach us about our own planet, distant exoplanets, and the synthesis of new materials. But diamonds don't just supply the namesake for the diamond anvil cell research. Over the last two decades, scientists have realized that the diamonds themselves contain a great deal of information about the deep earth. Most natural diamonds contain small amounts of mineral impurities called inclusions. While jewelers hate them, inclusions are invaluable for learning about Earth pro Earth's processes and evolution. And our speaker tonight is one of the world's leading investigators in diamond geochemistry. So before joining the Geophysical Laboratory just last month as its director, uh, Mike was professor and head of the School of Earth Sciences at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. He earned his BS degree from the University of Nebraska and his PhD in geology and earth science from the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, he has broad research interests in high pressure and high temperature experimental petrology, geochemistry, and mineral physics. Uh, and he has conducted many studies that shed light on the origin and evolution of Earth and other planetary bodies. So although he just arrived in Washington uh, last month, he's no stranger to the Carnegie Institution because Mike was actually a postdoc uh, here in the 90s. Um, so he's been around for a while and we're really happy to have him back. Um, in subsequent years, he's really maintained his relationship with Carnegie, primarily through collaborations with Car Carnegie's Deep Carbon Observatory. So we're especially pleased tonight to welcome Mike, not only to the Capital Science Lecture Series tonight, but to the institution's scientific staff, and is to welcome his as one of our new directors. So let's welcome uh, Michael Walter to the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's an uh, <clears throat> incredible honor and pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank Carnegie Science for giving me this opportunity to speak tonight. And I'd like to thank the organizers for putting on these incredible events. It takes a lot of work to do that. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming and, and listening to my talk. And as John said, um, I'm going to be talking about the deep earth tonight and specifically about diamonds and their role in our understanding of deep earth and deep earth processes, it, it often occurs to me that we live on a plane. Um, I'm not a flat, I'm not part of the flat earth society. <laughs> I, did grow, I did grow up in Nebraska, so I'm sympathetic with that perspective. <laughs> but, um, 
you know, when I think about it, we're on one side of this plane, and on the side of the plane we're on, it's optically transparent. We can, we can go, we can collect rocks, we can see the ocean, we can collect samples of ocean water, we can build telescopes, and we can look into the heavens and, and peer back to the very beginning of, of, of our universe. But if we take that same telescope and we point it down, it's optically opaque. We can't see very much on the other side of that, of that plane. And so for the first half of my talk tonight, really, I'm going to um, bring you kind of up to speed with how we know what's on the other side of this plane. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the more recent research that I've been doing uh, on that side of the plane as well. Uh, before I do that, I did want to give a little bit of a shout out to my, to my new um, uh, role at, at the geophysical lab. And for those of you who don't know, this is a picture of the geophysical lab. It's located in, in Northwest DC in this beautiful campus. We're co-located co with another department, the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism. And um, as John was saying, it was, this, it was established, one of the first departments of, of Carnegie Science, and it was established in 1905 to investigate the processes that control the composition and structure of the Earth. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. So this is kind of a, I don't know, a hundred year, a little bit over a hundred year update on how, how we've progressed in that time. If you want to know more about, about science at the Geophysical Lab and all the exceptional scientists who I decided I would embarrass as well tonight um, at the Geophysical Lab, please, please visit our website. Um, and again, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to work with all these exceptional people um, in, in, coming, in the coming future. Okay, so I'm going to start out with the question, what's below and how do we know? And kind of take you through that. And the first thing I thought I'd do is kind of get an idea of what the public perception might be of the interior of our planet. And I'm gonna start back in the 19th century with this classic, Jules Verne, everybody knows this book, Journey to the Center of the Earth. There's been lots of bad movies as well about it. This is, this is actually a, a pictograph from, from that book. And you see our three intrepid ex explorers what were they called? Otto, Hans, and, and uh, Axel, I think. And they're in this giant cavern in the center of our planet with, based on the symmetry of these crystals, looks like giant quartz crystals emanating from the cavern walls. So that was, you know, I, I can cut them some slack back in the 19th century. They probably didn't have a lot of information about what was inside of our planet. But if we fast forward a century and a half, this is the movie from the movie The Core, and, and what we see is, again, a giant cavern, and they've upgraded a little bit to amethyst crystals, apparently. Um, but either there's a serious lack of imagination here, or we, we, haven't, we haven't progressed very far in a century and a half. If you go home with one message tonight, you go home and some family member, your children say, what did you learn tonight? Please let it be that there is no way that there's a big cavern in the center of our planet with quartz crystals emanating from the, from the sides. So how do we know that is the, is the question, I guess. One way is from seismology. So we're going to start there because it's really the deep Earth image through sound. It's kind of a giant sonogram for our planet, if you will. And in order to do that, we need to kind of smack the Earth with a hammer to get sound waves to penetrate all the way through it so we can interrogate it through these sound waves because it's, as I mentioned, opaque to um, optical radiation. And the energy that we use is actually energy from earthquakes. You can also use em energy from thermonuclear explosions. And in fact, a uh, magnitude six or seven earthquake is about the same as a, as a 200 kiloton explosion. And that's enough energy for these sound waves to make it all the way through the planet. And so seismologists, like many of those at uh, our Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, have used these waves, these waves to, to explore the depths. There's two kinds of waves. One's a so-called P wave or primary wave, and the atoms in the material vibrate in directions which are parallel to the direction of the, of the, of the propagation of the energy. And another wave called an S wave or a secondary wave where the atoms are vibrating in a, in a plane perpendicular to the propagation of the energy. Sometimes these are called compressional waves and shear waves. And so if we have an earthquake somewhere near the surface um, and we have seismic stations, seismometers set up around, around the globe, we can actually watch these waves arrive as they transit through the planet. 
And because the way that they transit through the planet depends on the material properties, we can start to relate those seismic waves to what the, what the materials are uh, in the planet. Those waves all also bounce off of boundaries in the planet. If you've got massive changes in, in, the, in the chemistry or in the, um, in the mineralogy of the planet, and, and it's a big density change, for example, then you can have seismic reflections and the waves split and do all kinds of things. And seismologists have a whole range of tools to be able to relate that to, to structure. So what does it look like? This is our deep earth seismic section. This is a so-called one dimensional velocity structure, sort of an average structure for the planet. And you see in the blue here is P waves. This is depth and, and seismic velocity in kilometers per second. And the red is the, is the S waves or the, or the shear waves. And just from this alone, you can see that we can divide the planet into, into sort of layers. The main two layers are the mantle. Well, we're up here on the crust. So we're going to ignore that for all intents and purposes tonight. It's about a 50 kilometer thick layer, and we're going to pretend it doesn't exist. And below that, we have a mantle which is made of rock as well. It's, it's, it's basically silicate rock, SiO2 and, and, and magnesium and iron, calcium, aluminum, a bunch of other things, but it's rock. And then we have this major boundary at around 3,000 3, kilometers, and that boundary separates the, the, the rock from the core of the planet, which is made primarily of metal, okay? And you'll notice here as well, and that's iron metal, it's almost pure iron, there's some other crud in there as well, but it's mostly iron. Um, the, the shear waves, you'll notice, drop all the way to zero at this boundary. And the reason that happens is because liquids don't have any shear strength, and so they can't transmit shear waves, and this is how we know that, the, that part of the core, the outer core we call it, is liquid. And the fact that it's liquid is really, really important, and I'll come back to that uh, a little bit late, later. So this is what we do. This is just from seismology alone, we get this kind of a picture, and it's a very accurate picture of the overall layering of the planet. We have an upper mantle, a lower mantle, both, both made of rock, and a core which is made of, of iron-rich metal, outer core liquid, inner core solid. Now I should point out as well that this is the only planet we know this well. But if you notice, last, last week the InSight mission blast, uh, launched off to Mars, and there's a seismometer on that. And if that works, then we're going to have, uh, well, we should have something like uh, for Mars that is not too dissimilar to our understanding of this basic structure of, of the Earth. There's another method in seismology that is... Uh, will be familiar to you in terms of uh, CT scans. So, in t it, so hopefully none of you have had to do this, but if you had, you'll know that x-rays, they use x-rays and they transit all the way around uh, a human being, for example. And by, by collecting these x-rays from a whole range of different angles, you can compute a two-dimensional or three-dimensional image. In this case, that's the interior of a human being, which is a bit messy looking. And actually we have the same kind of of ability to image the interior of our planet through a thing called seismic tomography. So if we have enough earthquakes coming through through a single station and enough of these, um, of, of these compressional and S waves coming, um, intersecting at a point, we can start to build a picture of the interior of the planet that looks like this. So here is just velocity relative to some value. Um, so this blue is fast and, 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 and red is slow. And when we do this, this kind of tomography, what we see is that even though we know we have this, this layered structure, the tomography reels, reveals a much more complicated situation where blue is typically interpreted to be cold and red is typically interpreted to be, to be warmer material, less dense material, and we see that some cold material is moving down perhaps and warmer material is moving up, and I'll come back to the importance of that uh, later in the talk. Okay, so we have seismology which tells us in general what the layered structure of the planet is, what, what the complexity might be inside, but how do we relate that to actual material? What do we know about, about, the, about the minerals that make up and constitute the planet. How do we know that the, that the core is made of iron, for example? I told you that, but I didn't give you any explanation for that. So we have to have a compositional model, first of all, for the interior of our planet. How do we develop that? Well, one way is because we have materials from the interior. 
So magma is generated at depth. Most of the magma on the planet, the magma that's erupting from Kilauea as we speak, comes from a depth of around 100 kilometers. So it is sampling part of the deep earth for us. And if we have some understanding about, about how those melts form and what they might form from, it gives us some evidence of, of the planetary interior composition. But more importantly, sometimes these magmas bring up chunks of the mantle with them. Okay? And so here's an example of some lava. This is in fact a Hawaiian lava. And in that lava, we have a chunk of the mantle. And you'll see it's green, it's comp comprised uh, a lot of the mineral olivine, which you'll, which you'll know from the gemstone peridot. That's where, that's where we get that. And so this allows us to, to, to analyze that material. What is its bulk composition? And that together with looking at the most primitive meteorites that we find in the solar system, along with spectroscopy from the solar photosphere, um, we were able to put together a model for the bulk composition of the silicate part of our Earth and even the bulk composition of our entire planet. Now, once we have that, we can start to make experiments that will determine what the mineralogy is as a function of pressure and temperature and start to try to relate those to the seismic evidence. Um, but even so, we have to make some, some assumptions because these kinds of xenoliths, they call, we call them, these bits of the mantle that are brought up in volcanic rocks, only come from the upper two or 300 kilometers of, of the mantle. So that's a lot of Earth that we don't sample in this way. And so we have to make pretty big extrapolations. Basically, the assumption is this is representative of the entire mantle, for example. So we've got this model now for what we think the mantle is made of. Now we need to do experiments um, to determine what the mineralogy is as a function of pressure and temperature. How do we do that? Because as we go down, of course, the pressure becomes higher and so does the temperature. And in fact, the pressure at the center of our planet is about 3.3 megabars, 3.3 million atmospheres. Um, that's very, very high pressure. And the temperature of the interior of the planet is something like 7,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, which coincident coincidentally is about the same temperature as the solar photosphere. I think it's entirely a coincidence. There's no relationship there, but it's uh, kind of an interesting one. So how do we do these experiments? How do we recreate in the laboratory um, the conditions that exist deep in the planet? And this is something um, that has been one of the legacies of the geophysical lab. They're one of the first places to develop the technologies necessary to create these, these very high pressures and temperatures, and they continue to be at the forefront of pushing the frontiers in that way. So one way is to build a big press like this. This is a press I worked on when I was uh, uh, in Japan for some years, and that's about three meter, meters high. It's, it's a, got a big ram and, and can produce thousands of tons of force over a really large area. And what we do then is we cascade that force down to a very small area through a series of anvils that are driving the stuff together. So in the middle of this business here, we have these eight cubes. They're made of a very hard material called tungsten carbide. And we truncate the corners of those cubes to little triangles. So that comprises an octahedral volume. And then we create a little, this is a pressure cell that we put in the middle of all that. And inside of our pressure cell then we have a tiny little capsule uh, with about a milligram of sample in it. And that sample is some of that mantle that we brought up, that I showed you that was brought up in the lava. And we grind it up in the laboratory, stick it in that capsule, squeeze it to very high pressures, heat it to very high temperatures. We put a little furnace in, in through this as well and, and run a current through it. And so we can reproduce these very extreme pressures in the laboratory this way. Then we simply have to take our sample out and analyze it and for, its, for its mineralogy. So with this type of technology, I'm not going to talk a lot about this type today, um, we can get to about 700 kilometers. So that takes us just into the lower mantle. And we've learned a lot about the mineralogy of the upper mantle and the, and the top part of the lower mantle and, and how melts are formed in that region. And there's been you know, 50, 60 years worth of research that I'm condensing down into a punchline here um, based on this type of technology. But again, this only takes us to around 700 kilometers, and we're interested to know the, what's happening in the rest of the planet. So where do we go from there? 
Um, and John alluded to this. There's another technology, and this was really brought into the Earth Sciences again at the Geophysical Lab by um, Peter Bell and Dave Mao about 50 years ago. And, and we're still pushing the envelopes of what this technology can do. And so you can kind of, these are gem quality diamonds. Um, and, and they're cut actually even in a, in a brilliant cut, just like you would for a ring. And typically where you have that point that's going down into, set into your ring, we, we flatten off that little point into what we call a culet. And that culet size will be about a couple of hundred of microns in diameter. And it's between the tips of those two diamonds then that we can squeeze things. And diamonds are the hardest known natural material that we have, one of the hardest known materials. And um, because pressure is equal to force um, times area, if we have a very small area, we don't need a lot of force to produce extremely high pressures. So you think about the last slide I showed with the very big press, you might think, well, to go to the center of the earth, we need to have a press the size of this room. That's not the case because ultimately it's the strength of those anvils that determines how high a pressure we can achieve. With the diamonds, we can achieve incredibly high pressures on this very small area uh, because of the incredible strength of the diamond itself. Now we do break them and we break lots of them, actually. Um, um, but they're not as rare or as expensive as you might think. A great attribute of the diamond anvil cell is that it's optically transparent. Transparent to a, a, a wide range of radiation so that we can see our samples and we can interrogate our samples as well with a whole range of techniques. So here what you're, what you're doing is you're looking down through one of the diamonds at our sample. Uh, we have a gasket which is made of metal that we'll put between those two tips and we'll, draw a very small, uh, we'll drill a very small hole, like about 100 microns, something like the width of a of a human hair, for those of you who have hair. Um, and, and our sample then is a very, very small chip. Typically we'll make it of, of glass. And it's, it's, it's basically a piece of dust, really. And again, we, we, what we do is we put compositions in there that we think are representative of the mantle. So we, we would reproduce the composition of that xenolith, that mantle xenolith that we find in, in the lavas reproduce it, make it into a glass, make a small chip of that glass and put it in our diamond anvil cell. And that's what you're looking at, at here. And again, what we can do is there's all kinds of probes for this. One thing is we can shoot lasers through the diamonds and we can heat them up to very high temperatures by focusing the laser down to a very small spot. So we shoot an infrared laser into the diamond anvil cell and heat it to extreme temperatures. We can also use other kinds of lasers for different kinds of probe that interrogate the structure as well. And with this particular technology, we can go all the way to the center of the earth and beyond. Okay, so we can get, we can get that 3.3 megabar. In fact, I think the record for a diamond anvil cell is around five megabars and we have um, aims at the geophysical lab to, to reach the, the, um, the gigabar level. So something that would be more suitable for the in interior of some of these very large exoplanets, uh, for example. Now, one of the primary ways that we use to interrogate our samples, to know what we've made, and remember, the point of all this is really to be able to go back to the seismology and determine what the, those seismic wave velocities that we measure actually are, we've got to have ways to understand not only what the mineralogy is as a function of pressure and temperature in the planet, but we've got to know something about the elastic response to seismic waves. And the way that we can measure these kinds of properties is through using high energy x-rays. And these high energy x-rays are created at places like this. This is, I just chose this one because it has the name Diamond. It seems the theme of the talk. But this is the Diamond Light Source in the United Kingdom. It's a place that I've spent a lot of my time working. And it's, a, it's an accelerator. It's an electron accelerator. And so when you accelerate electrons at near the speed of light, and then you bend them with giant magnets, a byproduct of that, through conservation of angular momentum, is, is the emission of high energy x-rays. And these high energy x-rays are also very coherent x-rays. And what we do is, this is an atom smasher. The point of making this, this thing, and, and there's, there's a number of these uh, around the world, 
is to use those x-rays and we develop a whole series of stations all around this ring and we take off some of those x-rays and in the case of diamond animal cell work we can focus those x-rays right down to a few microns which is incredible and the x-ray flux over those two microns is is um, is tremendous but it needs to be because our sample is so small and if we want to interrogate that small of a sample we have to have a really really high x-ray flux so here's an example. Again, we're looking down through the diamond anvil at a sample which is being laser heated. Okay, so that's sitting there at around something like 50 or 60 GPA. It's equivalent to maybe the middle of the mantle in this particular experiment. And it's being heated to three or 4,000 degrees Kelvin by shining an infrared laser through it. And then we can do this at the beam line and have this ability to measure properties in situ. This is key. At those high pressures and temperatures, we can interrogate the sample at the micron scale. So we shoot these high energy x-rays through the sample and it turns out that the wavelength of x-rays is very similar to the atomic spacing in the minerals that we're trying to, to understand what they are and so they interact with, with our sample. Um, they, be, they diffract, for example, and that diffraction pattern, which you're seeing over here, that's the diffraction of the x-ray, can be turned into a pattern that can then be used to understand what the mineralogy is, what crystals have we formed at these extreme conditions of pressures and temperatures. Now it turns out there's a whole range of tools that we can use um, with x-rays to determine things like seismic velocities as well. So we can determine the elastic properties of the minerals as well, which we can then relate back to um, uh, back to our seismic velocities. For example, again, this is, this is a, 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 a mantle mineral called perovskite. It's in the perovskite structure, and this is actually a diffraction pattern. This is telling you about this particular geometric arrangement. So I've brought you kind of all the way up to speed for the last 50 or 60 years worth of research, and it's research that continues um, today. But this is the mineralogical model for the mantle that has been developed through all of these, all of these experiments um, over this time. So again, we're starting with a model that's based on a rock that's something like this. This is our, this is our prototype. And over here, what again, what we see is our seismic velocity structure. And here I'm stopping at the core mantle boundary, so this is just the upper mantle. This is the density. And we see um, that we have these, these layers, okay? Basically, the seismic velocities show us that we've got these layers, and those layers um, match exactly with changes in mineralogy as a function of pressure and temperature. So in the upper mantle here, we have olivine being the dominant mineral, and garnet, that's another mineral you're probably familiar with, that's the big red beautiful one over here, and some, something called pyroxene. And the olivine changes with pressure and temperature to more dense structures. One of these minerals is called wadsleyite, Another one is called ringwoodite. And we'll come back to these because they're really important and very unique minerals. Um, and I'll tell you why uh, momentarily. And they have a different seismic velocity. And these minerals that we produce in the lab when we go to high pressures and temperatures, sure enough, they come in just at the pressures where we see this ch the jumps in the seismic velocity. So can re we can relate them directly, which means our model for the mantle must be pretty good, our, mo our, metal, our, our model mantle composition. Then there's this, this seismic boundary at about, about 660 kilometers, which um, is a major phase change in the mantle from something which is dominated by olivine and its polymorphs, swaziite and ringwoodite, to an entirely different structure, and it's a mineral called bridgmanite. And this again is that what I showed you in the last slide. This is this perovskite structure. It's basically a change. It represents a fundamental change in the coordination of silica and oxygen in these minerals to a much denser structure because that's what you need at higher pressures is, is, is for minerals to be stable, is to have denser um, structures. So this is our view. This is our mineralogic view of the mantle. I think it's, it's, it's very well developed. It's very solid result. We know this. There's a lot of questions that we still have, but this is what we get. And it's a very static view, though. Okay, this would make you think, if you left right now, you'd say, well, the mantle's got all these layers in it. We kind of know what it is. And, and that's the end of the story. Well, it's not. It's kind of the beginning of the story. Because actually the interior is a really dynamic place. And it's something which sets our planet apart from all of the other planets in our solar system. And basically that means any other planet that we know very well. Um, 
rocky planet at least, and that it's incredibly dynamic. And why is it dynamic? It's dynamic because of this, because it's really hot inside, and it's really, really hot at the core, and that heat is trying to escape. And this heat, and so this is an example of what we call the geotherm for our planet. Uh, this geotherm is actually constructed by, by understanding where these phase changes occur in our experiments and being able to say, okay, we know it occurs at 660 kilometers. Our experiments tell us what temperature that occurs at, so therefore we can pin it there, and we can calculate the rest of the geotherm um, through thermodynamic principles. And so this is, this is what we believe to be the temperature structure of our planet, and you'll see it gets very hot in the interior, six or 7,000 degrees Kelvin. There's some uncertainty there. And this heat that is trying to get out is mostly primordial heat from accretion. So in our planet, our, our, the modern view of planetary accretion is that it happened largely through impacts with lots of planetesimals running into each other, and there's both gravitational heat from those impacts, but there's also a lot of kinetic energy in those impacts. And so this is a way to look at this heat in the interior of our planet is that it's buried heat from accretion. And now it's sitting there in the core, resides in the core, and it's trying to get out. The reason it has trouble getting out is because the mantle doesn't conduct heat very well at all. Okay, it's like, it's like a big ceramic. It's like it's hot metal in the interior with a whole big ceramic around it that doesn't like to let the heat get out, okay? So what actually happens is we've got these thermal boundary layers. We've got a thermal boundary layer at the core metal boundary. We're sitting at around 3,000 degrees Kelvin there. We've got a thermal boundary layer at the, at the surface. We're at around 300 Kelvin. That's a big difference. And that's just like putting your pot of water on your stove and heating it from below. What happens? It starts to heat up and it starts to move. It starts to convect. The, the heat just doesn't conduct through the water. It's much more efficient to remove the heat through that movement. And that's exactly what's happening in the mantle. Okay. I struggled to find a good diagram for this on the internet. And this is a very simple one, and it has some problems, but it kind of gives you the general idea. I like this one because it shows you how heat is conducting out of the solid inner core. The outer core is convecting, and the amazing thing about iron, liquid iron, at these kinds of pressures and temperatures, is that it has the viscosity of water. Okay? And the fact, that the, the fact that the outer core is convecting, and it's a metal, and in a metal, electrons are free to move around. And so now you've got a, a, a metal with these electrons that are free to move around. And because that metal is convecting, that means the electrons are moving. When you move electrons, we all know what happens. You create an electric field, and that electric field causes a spontaneous magnetic field. And that magnetic field is why we have, and this is why we have a magnetic field on our planet, and that protects all of us. It's why we have a habitable planet. So the fact that we've got a convecting core, and it's probably a lot related to the fact that we have a crystallizing inner core, um, protects us and shields us from the harmful radiation um, from the sun and keeps the planet habitable. Um, the mantle then is also convecting, but it's doing so, this is really, really vigorous convection here. The, the, the mantle's convecting, but it's doing so on much longer time scales. Think about a glacier, but, but orders of magnitude even slower than that. Right? So the mantle's behaving like a fluid, like a plastic. It's solid, and that's, that's, that's the number two thing I want you to take away from this talk. The planet is not molten inside except for the outer core. Okay? It's a solid. The mantle is a solid, but it just flows like a plastic um, over time. And that convection is how the heat moves around. Now, part of the... Um, a product of that, of that convection, of that plastic mantle, is that not only is the interior a very dynamic place, but so is the surface. And so you all know about the, the, um, plate te the, the theory of plate tectonics. I'd say it's one of the most successful theories in science. Been around for about 60 or 70 years now. And the idea is that because the outer surface of our rocky planet is cold, those plates break apart due to the movement of the mantle beneath it. They just can't stand the stresses of the drag of the mantle which is moving beneath it. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. And what we have is we have plates that are sometimes spreading apart. And when they spread apart, mantle upwells at that spreading place and melts and produces new oceanic crust. And in other places, the plates, in wherever it's red here, the plates are becoming cold and dense, and they become so dense that they want to sink back, in, back into the mantle. And this is called subduction. So we have new, new plates forming here, and we have plate destruction forming wherever we have, wherever we have the red lines. 
Okay. And it's really this subduction that I want to talk about for the remainder of the talk and what, how it affects the interior of our planet. So the surface and the interior are connected by subduction. We can go back to our seismic tomography and we can see this quite clearly. Okay, so this is tomogra tomographic images from subduction zones all around the planet. And what these show, again, cold is, is or, or blue is cold and, and, and dense. And what we see is that wherever we have these slabs which are subducting, the lithosphere is breaking and, and moving back down into the mantle, we can image that. Sometimes these are, these are breaking right through all these phase transitions and going all the way to the core mantle boundary. Other times we see that they kind of flatten out and sit um, in, in this thing we call the transition zone, which is where olivine transforms to wadsleyite and ringwoodite. So subduction is a very important process. It links the surface with the interior over time, and it's something that's probably been occurring on our planet for around three billion years. We argue about this, it might be two billion, it might be three and a half billion, but let's just call three billion for a good ballpark figure. That means there's been recycling of surface materials back into the mantle for a very long time. So subduction zones, I'll call them recycling centers. This is a bit of a complicated drawing. I've blocked out most of the complication for you here. But I want to give an idea of a little bit of a close-up of the subducting slab. So we've got a convecting mantle here. We've got our rigid mantle plate here. And on top of that plate sits oceanic crust. The oceanic crust is, again, formed at these mid-ocean ridge spreading centers where the plates are pulling apart. Magma upwells, solidifies into a, a rock type we call basalt and it's about seven kilometers thick and on top of that are sediments and all the other grunge and stuff that ends up falling down through the ocean and is sitting on the surface of the oceanic floor and all that stuff eventually gets subducted back into the mantle and a large portion of that is carbon well in the sediments especially is carbon and water and i want to talk about those two because they're very important elements obviously they're very important for life and habitability on our planet and there are kind of surface carbon and water cycles that we may all be familiar with. But the point I want to bring home here is that there's longer term cycling of carbon and water into the mantle that may be really important in stabilizing our planet's habitability over that three billion year time scale. Why is it that the atmosphere maintains relatively constant in its composition over time? Why is it that the ocean, the amount of ocean water is about the same over, as far as we know for the last three billion years? It may be linked to a much deeper cycling of carbon uh, and water. And I want to interrogate that process a little bit. Um, so carbon and, and water, uh, a lot of it comes out at volcanoes, but a lot of that, well, some, some of that, and we argue about how much of that, makes it back into the deep mantle. And now I'm going to talk about evidence for looking at that deep carbon cycle. And this is where we bring diamonds back into it. This is a deep earth image through diamonds too. And this is something that I've been working on for the, for the last uh, decade or so. And so here, and John referred to these diamonds, usually we don't want to have these inclusions in diamonds. So here's a bunch of really beautiful octahedral, uh, relatively large diamonds. And you see that each one of these diamonds has uh, a black thing inside of it. And so this is kind of like an insect in amber, if you will. And here's a nice red garnet, and here's a, a nice green pyroxene. And diamonds are wonderful because they are incredibly resistant and robust materials. Once you make them in the mantle, they can stay around for a long, long time. So some of my colleagues at DTM, Steve Shirey, for example, has worked on these kind of diamonds that are formed at the base of the plates for a long time has been able to basically understand the, the structure of, of the, the deep part of the lithospheric roots of, 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 of the cold plates at the surface and date them and understand things about when plate tectonics started on the basis of these kind of, of diamonds. So where do diamonds form? So here's a cartoon and the diamonds I was just talking to you about, 99% basically, 98%, something like that, of all the diamonds, most likely if you're wearing diamond jewelry tonight, that diamond came from the base of the cold lithosphere. So the deepest part of what we call the continental roots. 
And these have been around for about three billion years. It's very likely if you have a diamond ring or some diamond jewelry that it came from this part and it's about three billion years old, which is kind of cool in and of itself. But these aren't the diamonds I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about a, a much more rare kind of diamond that comes from e even deeper, and we call these super deep diamonds. And these super deep diamonds come from depths that extend all the way into the lower mantle, and in fact, possibly as far as the deep lower mantle. Now, why do we, why do we see these diamonds at the surface at all? Um, they come to the surface in a very rare kind of magma. It's called a kimberlite. And these kimberlites are really volatile rich. They have a lot of water and CO2 in them. And they're thought to be generated at depths of around two or 300 kilometers. And they basically supersonically force their way through to the surface. Um, it's like opening a, 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 a Coke can or a Coke bottle. And you wouldn't want to be around when one of these went off, let me tell you. Um, I don't know what the chances of that are happening in anyone's lifetime, not too great. I hope. Um, so they're brought to the surface, so they're, they're excavating these diamonds as they come. Now, a neat thing about these deep mantle, super, these super deep diamonds is, and I'll show you in a moment how we know they're super deep, um, it's through their mineral inclusions. It, we, the, 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 the kimberlites that bring them to the surface don't come from the lower mantle. They come from up here. And so these super deep diamonds actually are moving in the convective flow of the mantle, we believe. And so where they're formed is, is preserved by the minerals inside them. So let's say you had one that was formed very deep in the mantle. We can tell that from the mineral that's trapped. But eventually it makes its way all the way to the surface. And it tells us something about this deep carbon cycle and potentially the deep water cycle uh, as well. So again, these kinds of diamonds are coming all the way from the lower mantle and perhaps all the way from the core mantle boundary uh, in some cases. And so in terms of samples of the interior, these are really the only samples that we can hope to have from depths below around a couple of hundred kilometers. And they allow us to, to, to reconstruct some of the processes that are happening at these extreme conditions. So we have a diamond like this, how do we, how do we unlock it? So here's a, a, a typical diamond that we, might, that we might use. Now we're kind of lucky because these super deep diamonds, they tend to be the grottiest, yeah, not always, but they tend to be really grotty, yellowish kind of diamonds that nobody wants and you use them for, for um, industrial use. And so we can go kind of buy a whole load of them and then uh, pick through them for ones that might have the inclusions that we want to look at. And so we look down through these diamonds and we say, okay, there's an inclusion, now we've got to get to it. This is a very slow, painful process because it, it, it involves polishing the diamond down to the surface where the inclusion is at. We do have some in-situ spectroscopic techniques we use as well, but ultimately we need to expose these, these diamonds. And so here's an example of a very small inclusion sitting in that diamond. And eventually when we polish it down into it, it looks something like this. And I want you to note the scale here. So that's 10 microns. So again, we're looking at a really, really tiny piece of a mineral that was trapped in this diamond when it was growing. And you cannot believe the amount of information that is preserved in a little mineral grain uh, like that. It's pretty astonishing that we're very good at storytelling. It's probably a bit of both. So, where, so the first question I'm going to ask is where does the carbon come from? Okay. So diamonds are made of almost pure carbon. Right? There's some, some impurities, nitrogen, a bit of this and that. But for the most part, diamonds are pretty selective and they don't like anything else in their structure and they're, and they're all carbon. And we're going to say, where does that carbon come from? And back to the subduction zone, the kind of carbon, we have some idea about the flavors of carbon. And that comes from the fact that there's two stable isotopes of carbon, carbon-12 and carbon-13. 99% of the carbon is carbon-12, about a percent is carbon-13. But through processes, geological processes and life processes, you can fractionate these carbon isotopes one for another. For example, um, biology tends to fractionate them and tends to like to hold on to the light isotope. It's energetically a little easier to deal with the light carbon than it is to the, to the heavy carbon. And so if we think about the carbon that's being subducted, we, the mantle is sitting at about, okay, this is a difference measured in something called per mil. Instead of percent, just think of it as, as a difference relative to some standard. It turns out this, that the standard is, is carbonate. 
And so carbonate, which is a form of inorganic carbon that makes up limestone, it's at zero because it's the, it's the standard. We think the mantle is about minus five on average. And organic material, which is being deposited in sediments, is light because of this preference for biology to the, to the light isotope. It's about minus 20 to minus 40, something like that. So now we can take our diamond. This is a cross section of one of our diamond. It's, being, it's, it's a, a, called the cathode luminescent image. And we can see a really complicated layered structure uh, to the diamond. And we can go in with, a, with, with something called an ion microprobe. And we can analyze very small, each one of those layers for its carbon isotopic composition. And when we do that for a whole range of diamonds, we get a very interesting result for these super deep diamonds. So again here, I'm gonna show you the number of diamonds in a moment. This is our scale of delta C13, this difference between carbon 13 and carbon 12 ratio uh, relative to some standard. Carbonate is at zero, that's our standard. The mantle is sitting here at about minus five. And here's what the super deep diamonds are. Okay, so they have this very, this propensity for very light carbon, which looks a lot like our subducted organic carbon. And so our interpretation of this, and we do argue about these interpretations, but our interpretation of this is that this represents a signal of subduction. This carbon, which is being preserved as diamond and trapping these, these minerals at very high pressures and temperatures, isn't the carbon that we expect was there in the mantle, sort of like primordial mantle carbon, it's subducted carbon. It started its life as it's at the surface and possibly as some little bug in the ocean. The mineral inclusions are equally telling and equally interesting. I would say even more interesting. And here's a whole suite of these inclusions. And again, you see the kind of scale here, 10 or 20 microns, they're very small. And you're probably noticing that they're very complicated looking. They're not single minerals, but they're actually composites of a number of different minerals. Okay, now the reason that happens is when these things were formed, they were single minerals. But since they've moved around in the mantle, like I told you, in these convection cells, they find themselves eventually at a pressure, pressure temperature condition where they're no longer stable as that single mineral. And so they separate into what we call unmixing into a number of different minerals. So the first challenge that we have is we have to put these back together. If we want to know what they're, if we, we don't know what they once were, we've got to integrate these compositions. Now we can do that by analyzing each one of these phases with something called an electron microprobe. So we, we determine its composition very, very accurately. And while there's a number of different techniques, uh, a very sophisticated one is to, is to use, again, X radiography. So we can take it to one of those synchrotrons and this is a, a movie of an image as we're moving up through the diamond and what you'll see through the inclusion, that's one phase, Ooh, there's another phase coming in. As we move through it, we get the full 3D reconstruction of that diamond. And all we have to do then is after we've done this is go polish into the diamond, measure the composition, use our 3D rendering to determine the volume of each of those phases. Then we can reconstruct it. We can tell you what the initial bulk composition was. Now, why is that important? It's because that bulk composition will reveal what mineral it was when it was at depth, all right? And this is what has been really fascinating about this is that if you take this oceanic crust, this basaltic material, and you take it to high pressures and temperatures and look at how its mineralogy changes, at the surface it's basically um, uh, uh, minerals like plagioclase, feldspar, and olivine, and pyroxene, and you take it to higher and higher pressures, you get this whole suite of different minerals. This is called stichovite and calcium proskite, and magnesium proskite, and calcium ferrite, and sodium aluminous phase, and garnet, and clinopyroxene. And what we found is that in these super deep diamonds, we can reproduce the entire mineralogy of this subducted material. So it's entirely consistent with our story that the carbon looks like it's subducted. And now the mineral inclusions are telling us that the minerals that are being trapped by the diamond was growing also began life at the surface. So these diamonds are tracing a very deep cycle in the mantle. And we call that maybe the, I don't know, the super deep carbon cycle. And the basis of our understanding of the rate of convection in the mantle, that cycle is of the order 100 million or 200 million years. 
And we believe that that cycle is important then, and one of the things we're investigating is how important is that into the long-term buffering of the atmospheric composition uh, for carbon and CO2. So we end up with a model yeah, that looks something like this. We have subduction of this material, stranding in the transition zone. We believe the carbon is coming from the slab and that melts as, as this material moves down, it actually melts. Those melts move up into the mantle and they react with it and that's when the diamonds form and that's when the minerals that they trap form. And eventually that material's coming back up to near the surface and eventually that carbon would, would be converted back into CO2 and come out of volcano. And that's sort of this long-term, 100 million year time scale carbon cycle um, that the diamonds are revealing to us. Okay, I'm, I'm doing it for time. Two more slides. The transition zone is a very, very interesting place. It's a possible water world. What do I mean by that? Here's my colleague, Graham Pearson. Graham Pearson was, was once a Carnegie in fact, he was a postdoc when I was a postdoc 25 years ago uh, at DTM. And you can't see it here, but that's kind of bluish. Maybe you can tell it's a little bit bluish. And what Graham did and his colleagues is they found the first and only, at this point, um, evidence for this mineral that was called, that's called ringwoodite. So remember, olivine changed to wadsleyite and then ringwoodite, and that's, a, that's an important mineral in that area called the transition zone in the mantle. Well, he found one of these, and what I didn't tell you about wadsleyite and ringwoodite is, unlike pretty much every other phase in the mantle, you can store a load of water in its structure. Olivine, not so much. Lower mantle minerals, hardly anything. Wadsleyite and ringwoodite can have weight percent amount of water in their structure. This gives the, the transition zone, that area between 410 and 660 kilometers, the capacity to store about three oceans worth of water. Okay, that's a lot of water. Um, I love some of the, uh, this was a big hit, a big PR um, smash, and here's, here's one of the, satanic hell diamond tells of sunless subterranean sea. <laughs> If, if I can ever have a headline like that, my career will be made, right? That is, uh, I'm so jealous of that. Here's another beauty here. Um, bubbling water under the, you know, under the ringwoodite reservoir, and we sort of have this transition zone with all this sort of a big swimming pool of water somehow connected to the surface. I laugh at this one, but in a way, it's kind of the point, is that this big potential reservoir of water at depth may in fact through the fact that we have this dynamic interior, be buffering the amount of water that's at the surface over long periods of time. It may in fact be that these deep carbon and deep water cycles are what makes our planet, planet habitable on this, on this very long time scale. Oh, um, is that backwards? It is backwards. Yes, I was supposed to show this first. <laughs> so, here is the transition zone, here is the potential reservoir, and here is the hydrous wadsleyite and hydrous ringwoodite. Yes, showing you that it was blue wouldn't have made a lot of sense to you if you hadn't seen this thing first. Not sure, not sure how that happened. So we're going to end now with what I'm going to call a modern image of Earth's interior. And so we have the inner core, the outer core, the outer core is convecting. And through seismology and through the mineral physics and the experiments that I've, that I've told you about, we're great at making cartoons. And this is our cartoon version of what's happening in our very dynamic planetary interior. We've got subduction sinking down in the mantle. We can image these mountain ranges on the core mantle boundary. We still don't know what those are about. This is kind of where the frontiers are. These are big structures that are apparent um, in seismicity. One, they're they're antipodal as well, one on one side of the core, one on the other side of the core. And we think upwelling of plumes at like Hawaii may be coming from these big piles and we really don't know what they're, what they're made of. We actually don't understand convection in the mantle. We think we know it happens and we can model it, but because we don't know uh, the viscosity of the, of the material very accurately, it's very difficult to, to understand it. And maybe water is very important for that because water has the effect of weakening minerals and so if there's water in the interior in these minerals, it may be why our planet convex, and for example, Venus, which is almost a sister planet and almost identical to our planet in the interior, doesn't seem to convect. It may be very dry, unlike, unlike our planet. And it's that deep cycling, it's that deep 
um, dynamic interior, um, which I believe buffers our planet and gives it its habitability. So the last slide is how far have we come in the last 350 years? And here's an interior version of our planet from Kircher, 1664. And I think he was pretty prescient, actually. <laughs> Crystallizing inner core, lots of stuff going down into the mantle, and not a bad job uh, by Mr. Um, Kircher. And finally, I'm just going to say special thanks to so many of the people that I've worked with, especially in Bristol, over the years. So great, if we have uh, some questions, we have microphones on either side here. So I'll give people a minute or two to do that. I missed the, I want to ask you, I think you just addressed it and I missed it at the end. I was going to ask about, you said something about Venus. Yeah. So what, what is the difference really between Venus and Earth? Well, we don't know for sure because we don't know a lot about Venus. Yeah. It's very hard to probe because it, all the probes dissolve in the atmosphere in about, about 30 seconds. <laughs> But we, we, we think that the interior in Venice may be completely dry, and so that the, the mantle may be very, very viscous and unable to convect. And, and one model is that it has a, a core as well that's very hot with lots of energy that wants to get out. And so it heats up, it heats up to a point where eventually it becomes, the density of the rock just above the, of the, of the core becomes so buoyant that the entire mantle overturns. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it causes wide-scale melting and then the entire surface of, of, planet, of the planet um, um, is um, coated with a new melt, basically. And this would happen on sort of maybe a hundred million or 200 million or 500 million year time scale, we really don't know. So it's a different kind of tectonics, just periodic. Yeah, I mean, I, this is interesting because the sizes of the plants aren't that different. They are so, so clearly, close. Clearly, you, if you just pick that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. And it's there's like, no magnetic field on Venus. Oh, there I, you go. Lots of problems for Venus. Okay, we'll start over here. Yeah, uh, two very quick questions, I hope. Uh, S-waves, they don't travel through the outer core because it's molten. You show that it has a speed to the inner core. Uh, have you directly measured that, or is that just conjecture? The, 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 what about the inner core now? You, well, your, your chart shows the speed of S-waves where they basically don't Oh no, travel. what happens is, is the, the, the P-wave energy that's moving through the outer core, yeah. once it hits the solid, part of that energy is converted back into S waves. Oh, and then back into P waves. And then back into P waves, and then back into, and so you saw some was like, it was like P, S, K, S, P. That's a wave that's a compressional wave that goes to, a, to, goes to an S wave, back to a P wave, back to S wave. And so, so someone's doing a lot of calculating. It's, yeah. <laughs> well, Laura does this, and I don't know how you managed to, to back all that out, but geophysicists tell me they can do it. Yeah, okay, and then uh, another question is, you talk about, Pressure equals force times area. Is it force times area or force divided by oh. area? Did I? Oh my God. <laughs> I was going to point that out too, but we figured that's okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Math has never been my strong suit. He's a director You're now. Exactly he doesn't need right. to know these things. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll go over here on this side then. <laughs> we'll kind of alternate. Go ahead, you had to, uh, Oh, God, that's sorry. horribly embarrassing. There you go. <laughs> can, can we We've edit, already can forgotten. We edit that can out, we edit please? that out in the really? live stream? Yes. We'll retake that later. I'll put, up, put the right now. <laughs> uh, what would happen if you put liquid water in the diamond anvil and like simulated the conditions inside the Earth? Like, what would happen to the water? Oh, that's a very good question, and we actually do that. Okay, and, and geophysical lab scientists have been one of the groups that Alex Gontrab has worked on that very question. And there's a whole number of phases of solid ice. Um, I think at least 10. So in the deep mantle, it's ice 10. Um, recently, in fact, there was a discovery in a diamond again of ice 7, right? Not ice 9. <laughs> For those of you who have read Kurt Vonnegut, all of you who laughed know about ice 9. But yes, yeah, so there's a whole range of different solid faces of ice, and by the time you get to ice 10, it's behaving much more like a, a silicate, in fact. It becomes ionic at those, at those conditions. Great. Since you are reconstructing the innards of the Earth, do you see any evidence of any of the major impacts, the Sudbury size or the moon-forming event impacts in terms of their effect? 
the on the interior. Well, it's it's hard to preserve that because you know we can preserve it sometimes at the surface, like Sudbury, for example, um, and giant impacts of that magnitude are larger very early in Earth's history because we can look at it at other planets and we can see that there was a, a phase of a lot of those kind of impacts. Um, but they're preserved because the planets are static. It's hard to preserve that on our planet because it's dynamic and a lot of those would have been subducted and any imprint that it would have had on the mantle would have been erased a long time ago because of, because of the process of plate tectonics. So we can see it sometimes when they, when they smack down into bits of the continents that have been stable for three billion years. But in terms of preserving evidence in the mantle of it, I, I don't know. Has anybody ever looked? Well, it's hard to, it's, well, first of all, the mantle's a hard place to look at in terms of samples. That's why so, I asked you. Right, so you'd have to see it in, I, yeah, I don't know. And I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if we'd know. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, near the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned the inside launch that occurred recently and uh, how we'll be able to study Mars's interior. Yeah. What do you expect or hope to find from that? That's a very good question. So we have some idea of the interior of Mars by measuring, we know its mass, we know its moment of inertia, and we can speculate on, on its interior structure. Um, what we don't know about Mars, for example, is how big the core is. We don't know how thick the crust is. And so when you're trying to make those calculations on the basis of the moment of inertia data, there's lots of trade-offs. So what we hope to be able to do is to say, for example, I mean, a great thing to be able to do is just say how big the Martian core is. Because if we get that right, we can pretty much nail its composition. And we can work from there to, na to, to, to make better estimates of the composition of the rest of Mars. And how long do you think that'll take to find, just as an estimate? Um, how long does it take to get to Mars? And it has to <laughs> land OK. And then I suppose we need some kind of a, an event to create the seismicity. Um, I don't know if they're waiting for an impact. Laura, do you know what, where, where does the energy come from? So we kind of have to wait around for an impact. So yeah, don't hold your breath. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. He's pretty young. He'll make it. I think he'll. So, um, I'm curious. So I find it fascinating how um, you know, the science here. Um, just, you, know, you started talking about fluids and whatnot. Just on that a little bit. Um, how do you think that uh, recent discoveries about the cycling of water and these diamonds and so forth could be used to, to track um, tectonic activity in the future, um, either on the long-term scale or, or even for short-term um, geological activity like uh, surface earthquakes, for example. Well, I don't know if we could, if we could track earthquakes, but the, the question about tracking, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of potential to actually be able to track the cycle through these diamonds. And the way you can do that is if you can date them. Now, the really old diamonds, the ones that, for example, my colleague Steve Shirey and, and Rick Carlson have worked on, um, you, can, you can date those by certain systems because they've been around for a long time and there's enough radioactive. We're talking about very small bits of material. If we could date each of the, each of the diamonds and our techniques could improve to do that, um, then we could start to have, and, and, be, and because we know the depth that they were formed at, and sometimes we know the depth that they unmixed at, so that gives us a link scale. Then if we could date them, and we know when they were brought to the surface, it gives us a delta T. We could start to, to actually, for the first time, measure the, the convective cycle and, and put, some, put some real constraints on the timing of that, of that deep Kármán cycle. That's, that's certainly a possibility, one of the things we're trying to do. Hi, I'm Heather Spence, I'm a marine biologist. And I'm curious what impacts um, there have been on fields outside of your own from, from what has been learned about the deep earth and what, or what impacts you think sh there should be. And I, I th I'm thinking in particular about sort of the revelation that there are sources of water outside of our traditional models of the water cycle and um, just, you know, what, what should people be aware of in other fields such as marine biology or or freshwater ecology, or chemistry? This is the kind of question that I was worried about. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, a, it's a really good question, okay? And, and so I think probably the answer is to start thinking through 
what the impacts are of the, the, the flux of material into and out of the planet and whether that changed with time and whether we can relate that to specific events in the geological record. For example, snowball earth. Does that have to do with something which was an interior process and part of the cycle? And if we can sort of reconstruct all the continents at that time and we can understand what the flux going into the mantle was and coming out, can we relate it? Another one is, for example, the giant oxidation event, which we always presume is a function of life in the oceans. Um, could that actually be related to, and this is, this is something that uh, one of my colleagues, Dave Mao, has been working on, is could that be related, related to something to do with, with mineralogy in the mantle? And the answer is possibly, actually. Uh, right. So that's, that's the kind of longer scale, big picture kind of thinking I think you'd have to try to tie with those kinds of time scales. Right. I hope that's a partial answer. That's great. Yeah. Hello and thank you. Um, first, let me say it's marvelous you have all these rocks in your head. It's, it's quite amazing. <laughs> You're not the first person that's told me that, actually. Yeah. Well, I wanted to boost your spirits. Thank you. Um, so, two questions. Um, can you expand a little bit more on the potential for the cleaning of the environment, the CO2 and that stuff? Didn't you mention that in, the, in your talk? I'd, I'd be interested in that. Right. And um, these minerals that, that you find, are they only in that area really, really deep, or are they other places on the planet? Right, okay. Um, the first question is, is a really good one. And you, know, you, you, you can sort of potentially put a lot of CO2 into mantle rocks. And that's because CO2 is very reactive with minerals like olivine. And there, there, there are actually a lot of people who, work, who, who are working on this problem. And the thing that's really neat about that is that sometimes these mantle rocks are exposed at the surface. Sometimes during subduction, part of the mantle is abducted onto the surface. So the plate goes down, there's mantle on, on, in the corner over here that sometimes slides up and ends up exposed at the surface. Basically a lot of Oman is mantle prototype that's exposed at the surface. And, and colleagues have done calculations to show that we could pretty much take care of the problem we have with CO2 in the atmosphere by reacting it all with, with the Oman ophiolite. It's called an ophiolite. The problem is you've got to get the CO2 to the ophiolite, okay? <laughs> And, and that's, that's, that's the technological challenge of it. How are you going to actually transport it and, and put it in there and allow it to react? The reactions are very fast as well. So it is something that it can happen on the right kinds of time scales. Um, the second question was around the minerals. Right. Um, so the answer is no, actually. You don't. So for example, Bridgmanite. This is the mantle that is, makes up most of the lower mantle. And it's the most abundant mineral on the planet by far and you'll never ever find one in a gem shop, in a gem shop. Unless, there's actually one way you can, because you can't name a mineral until you find it naturally occurring, and it's got a name. We used to call it magnesium perovskite for the longest time, and only in the last few years has it been named Bridgmanite, after one of the pioneers of high pressure research, by the way, Percy Bridgman. And the reason we were able to name that is because somebody found it in a meteorite, and so in meteorite impacts, the shock pressures can achieve high enough pressures to make those minerals. It was preserved in a meteorite. Someone analyzed it. Yep, it's got the right crystal structure. So yes, that's the only way. But normally, no, you'll never find it because by the time it gets to the surface, it's, it's reacted to something else. So most of this stuff is just down there. Most of this stuff is just down there. And we only know it's there because of experiments and because of seismology. Yeah. We'll take uh, two last questions, one here, one here. I'm curious about whether the minerals that, and ices that form so deep are stable uh, when the pressure is released and how much of they tend to react with other things as they get lifted up. Um, okay, that's a, very, that's a very good question. Some of them are stable upon pressure release, some of them aren't. Okay. Um, the very high pressure ices, no, definitely not. Um, Bridgmanite, in our experiments, for example, yes, you can, you can pressure quench it back to the surface. There's another variety of that called calcium perovskite. It's, it's almost exactly like the Bridgmanite, but instead of magnesium, it's calcium. 
And because the calcium is bigger, it distorts the structure when it's released in pressure, and no, you can't. So a lot of these very high pressure minerals, um, they're not pressure quenchable. In terms of, uh, again, and you saw from the mineral inclusions, they are reactive when they come back up. And so you, it's very difficult to preserve, which is why it was really unusual to find that ringwoodite as well. It was still in the ringwoodite structure. All right, last question. Yeah. You mentioned uh, diamonds that come from uh, uh, super deep diamonds that come uh, shot upward at supersonic speeds, and um, that I haven't uh, was. There's a theory that it hasn't been found, but that, that something like this may be in Indiana. Is there anything like this? Um, and a, a camberlite in Indiana. It it, it, it could be um, help. <laughs> um, there, there's one in Arkansas. <laughs> you, know, you know the diamond? You can, go, you can go and collect diamonds in Arkansas because there's a Kimberly. There's one in Wyoming. Um, I'm not familiar with one in Indiana, but there's one in Indiana. Yeah. Why not? Because yeah. it's, <laughs> it's, Indiana is, is underlain by, by, ancient, um, by ancient material, and so ancient, thick, crustal material, and so there certainly could be one. In fact, there's probably a lot of Kimberlites that we don't know about. They're quite small. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome to Washington. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Well, before we thank Mike, let me just remind you our next lecture is on uh, May 23rd. It's by Ray Rothrock, uh, a very interesting uh, man who has a new book called The Future of Cybersecurity, Winning the War. So it'll probably be quite different than this. But uh, you'll learn to, you should change your password probably more frequently. Uh, but let's thank uh, Mike Walter for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.